Hey, welcome back. So today we're going to be talking about key strategies for how to approach rotational motion problems. So maybe you're in a physics or an AP physics class and you need to know how to handle these problems. I'm going to show you the key strategies you need to know to be able to do this kind of thing. So an object rolling down a hill, like maybe it's a hoop or a sphere or a disc or a cylinder, any of those things can work here in terms of these strategies you're going to use. And I do want to teach this in such a way that if you're an AP physics student, this is going to be helpful. And even if you're not, this is still going to be helpful as well. So let's go ahead and get to it. First of all, we are going to want to draw our forces on our free body diagram. So I will suggest that you have a rather large circle to work with because we have to have multiple forces here. So what is a force that's operating on an object as it rolls down a hill? All right, well, you can probably say gravity at this point, and that's pretty straightforward, right? And we're going to assume that the force of gravity is going to apply at the center mass of the object. The mass of the object is uniformly distributed throughout. What's another force? Well, another force we're going to have is the normal force. And this is going to look possibly different than other types of forces that you've worked with in the past in free body diagrams. This normal force is going to be applied at the point of contact. That's going to be different than what we've done in the past. We do this when we have a rotational problem. And the reason for that is because the placement of the force matters. For a solid object, if you think about it, where the force is applied matters for a rotational object because of torque. If you apply force at, say, a doorknob and open a door, you would have a certain amount of torque. But if you were half the distance between the doorknob and the axis of the door, then you would have only half the torque, right? So it does matter. It does matter where you have these forces applied. And if it's a solid object, we can apply the forces at the perimeter of the object. All right, and to make this complete, we are going to say that friction is a thing, like we can have friction in these problems, and so we want to be prepared to be able to handle that. So I'm going to draw a frictional force, and it's important to draw the frictional force in the correct direction. So first of all, I'll label this as sub F for force due to friction, because that's the style that they would do this with the college board. But really, this is a static friction force right here. That may sound strange to you if we say, well, how is that static if this thing is rolling? And the reason for that is if you consider the rate at which this is moving, the translational speed is going to actually match exactly the tangential speed of this ball as it goes across. As long as we have something called rolling without slipping is how it's typically written in the AP FRQ problems. You'll see rolling without slipping. If that's the case, then your tangential speed is going to match the speed at which this thing goes down the hill, or you could say the speed of the center of mass. And so just an important reminder here, any of these forces on rotational objects need to be applied at the point of contact to be valid. And also keep in mind that the force due to gravity would be applied at the center of mass because that's where the average of the mass of the particles would be treated as that point. And so we are going to be using kinematics here. So before energy, so I'm assuming we're going to do this without using energy. It's actually easier if you do do it with energy, but at a lot of stages in the year, some of you have not gotten energy yet, and you do need to know how to do this as well. All right, let's build on some of the things that we've done in the course that I've done throughout this year of physics that I've taught. You can start with our x-axis. And whenever you have forces, I want my students to go ahead and use the sum of the forces strategy is what I call it. So let's think about the forces that are in the x-axis. One force that's in the x-axis is definitely FGX. Now, what we want to do is get into a good practice here as AP Physics C Mechanics students or as preparation for that, we're going to say FG is going to be over here. In other words, take that vector and make it into the hypotenuse of a right triangle and then you break down the components, but you do not do that directly on your free body diagram. You want to do that off the side. So we're going to draw that right here. That's a badly drawn triangle, but you get the idea. Then we're going to say FG is equal to MG, and we're going to say FGX is equal to MG sine of theta, and we're going to say FGY is equal to MG cosine of theta. If you don't know how to do that, I'll put a link up in the upper right right about now. That'll help you to work with that, but I think at this stage of the game, you should be comfortable with quickly writing out components and understanding where they come from. 
All right, so let's go back to this. We said that there is going to be an FGX component for this. I'm going to define to the right as positive X up as positive Y. And we have another force here. And so I will just label that as a generic force due to friction right here. Remember, that's really like a static friction force. And I do that here because AP Physics C Mechanics makes no distinction between static friction and kinetic friction. It's just called general friction. So that's what we're going to do here. Then our second line for the sum of the forces strategy is to write out Newton's second law. So that's what we're doing here. And we think to ourselves at this point, is this something or nothing? That's our strategy, and we say something or nothing. In this case, this is something. We assume that this ball, or whatever the object is, it's going to be rolling down the hill, and as it does so, there is an acceleration in the x-axis. You can think of this as the acceleration of the center of the mass, if you want, because that will help you to understand what we're talking about. All right, so we set those equal to each other. We say FGX minus the force due to friction is equal to mass times acceleration of the x. That's just preliminary work that we're doing, and if you've been following along with my previous lessons, this should be easy. We're just integrating some of the stuff that we've done previously. Then we move on to the sum of the forces in the y-axis. So we go ahead and start that. We're going to sum up the forces, literally all the forces in the y-axis. So what is a force in the y-axis here? Well, one of them is going to be the normal force, and the second is going to be the force due to gravity in the y-axis. And the second line for the sum of the forces strategy is again going to be Newton's second law, mass times acceleration of the y. And again, we want to ask ourselves, is this acceleration of the y, is this something or is it nothing? What do you think? All right, and in this case, this is going to be nothing. And so that's zero, so that whole term drops out. The reason why is because the ball rolling down the ramp is not magically going up into the atmosphere or something or going into the ramp. It's not moving in the y-axis at all, so clearly it's not accelerating in the y-axis. So then we set these equal to each other. Fn minus Fgy is equal to zero, so therefore Fn is equal to Fgy. And we know something about that. We know that Fn is now equal to mg cosine of theta. So that's how we would write this. Then again, the general strategy is you work with the sum of the forces in the x, sum of the forces in the y, and you bring it together with the friction equation. So let's go ahead and do that. All right, and so we're going to say our general friction force is here. And if we assume maximum friction, then what we can do is translate that into a slightly different user-friendly format. So we're going to say the force due to friction is equal to mu times Fn. And we do know something about Fn, right? We just solve for that. So we can say force due to friction is equal to mu times mg cosine theta. So that's the beginning. We haven't really done anything that is significantly different than something we've done in the past. In other words, this is all a logical stepwise progression of how you should approach problems with forces throughout the year. Let's go ahead and apply some new ideas to this, though, because it is rolling down a hill, the object, the sphere, or the cylinder, or whatever it is, and we do need to integrate some new ideas. So let's go ahead and do that. Okay, one more thing I want to do before I move on. I'm going to go ahead and label this as equation one, so you can see what I'm talking about. And what we can do is we can sub this into equation number one right here and see what happens. So we're going to be left with Remember, we talked about what FGX is, so let's sub that in as well. So this is our updated master equation that we're working with. We'll call that equation two. I do want you to focus on that for a moment and think to yourself, what is something we can do to simplify equation number two? Well, hopefully you can spot that there is a mass in every term. So we're going to simplify that. And just a preference thing, I'm going to move my unknown to the left side. So I'm going to say this. And we've got a really updated equation here. So I'll call this not 2. We've, we've simplified it even further. I'll call this bottom equation 2. That's an important equation. All right, so again, I promised that we would work with rotational motion and rotational ideas. So let's do that. So what's a crucial set of ideas to work with? What's, what's How about this? Forces are really important in physics, right? And thinking about these problems, what's the rotational version of force? All right, well, hopefully you're able to come up with torque, so let's use torque. 
to analyze what can be done. Now, I talked about what I call the sum of the forces strategy. What we're going to do is use an analogous strategy that I call the sum of the torques strategy. So let's think about this. The sum of the torques is equal to, and just like we did before with the sum of the forces, we're going to use the torques. And I want you to think about which of these three forces provide a torque, if any. And the answer is the force due to friction provides a torque. That's the only one that provides a torque. Why is that? Well, the normal force is pointing in the same plane as the friction itself. So what do you mean by that? Check this out. We have an overhead view, let's say, of a door. Let's say we have an overhead view of a door where this is the axis of rotation on the left over here, and you apply a force. Let's say you apply a force in this direction. How much torque is going to be applied on this door? Well, the answer is zero. There's no torque that's going to be applied on a door from an overhead view like this. And that's because there's no component of this force that is at a right angle to that first vector. We could call this first vector R. Sometimes it's called D. That's the first vector. And so we say the only thing that's going to provide torque here is just the force due to friction. So we could say that is R crossed with the force due to friction. And that's what we're dealing with here. And this cross product means something. I'll put a link in the upper right right about now if you need some more help on that. But that's going to be the torque provided by the force due to friction. And then the second line for the sum of the torque strategy is just going to be the rotational version of mass times acceleration. So what's the rotational version of mass times acceleration? Well, the rotational version of mass is going to be a moment of inertia. And acceleration is actually going to be angular acceleration. I am going to change this slightly to this format up here because we do know that they are already at right angles to the first vector. You could say maybe I could draw another dotted line here in a slightly different color so you get the idea. This is like your R vector right here. This is your radius from the axis of rotation right in the middle going to the edge where the force due to friction is applied. Notice that this is at right angles to the force due to friction. So it's already a cross product, so to speak. So let's use that info, set these equal to each other, and see what we have here. All right, so this is an important equation here. This is now using some of our rotational information to be able to do something useful with it, solve a problem. And at this point, you have a lot of different directions you could go depending on what the problem needs or asks of you. One thing we probably are going to want to do is relate this type of thing, this acceleration, to this angular acceleration over here. So I do want to talk you through how we could think through that. Now, I will mention there is a really important equation. It's a small but mighty equation in AP Physics C and Mechanics that we need to talk about. This is on your equation sheet right here. So this is your linear speed at the center of mass is equal to the radius times the angular speed or angular velocity, depending on if you have the direction or not. Now, this is on your equation sheet. Okay, and so what we can do with that, this second equation that I'm going to use here is not on your equation sheet, but we can quickly derive it from the first if we think about the acceleration version of this. So any guesses as to what the acceleration version of this equation would be? Well, what it's going to be is acceleration in a linear sense, or you could say the acceleration of the center of mass. This is equal to the radius times the angular acceleration. That also implies if we solve for angular acceleration, we could say that's equal to A over R right here. All right, so really crucial that you have this equation down. Once you have this equation, you can derive the second equation over here quickly. And now what that's going to allow us to do is to integrate some of the material that we have for acceleration that we solve for up here with the rotational information that we're starting to use to be able to solve the problem. I just noticed, by the way, that there was a mu k here. I'm going to need to change that to just a generalized mu. And if we go back over here, we can say r times the force due to friction is equal to i times a over r. All right, so one implication of this is we can just bring our r's out here. So this is r squared. And now we can sub in what we had done previously for acceleration. And we're left with something like this. So really does depend on the problem and where you need to go with it. There's really one more thing we need to talk about and how you're going to deal 
with the i. So if it's a regular shape, you're probably going to be given an equation for it. Although there are really like two or three you should probably memorize. So one would be for like a sphere. You could say for a sphere, it's going to be two-fifths mr squared. Or maybe you have the moment of inertia for a cylinder, which would be one-half mr squared. Now I do want to point something out here. So generally we talk about mass as if it's a little m when we're dealing with translational motion, just moving from point A to point B. In rotational sense, usually we talk about mass as if it's a capital M, but they're the same essentially for this. Just be careful with that. And then this little r is same kind of thing. It's just radius. And for some reason with rotational motion, it's written as a big R, but they can cancel each other out. So if we take that info and see what we can cancel, we do something useful. So check this out. Notice that our R's will be gone. And we have this summit of equation to work with here. So most problems, if you do something like this, this will take you through probably 90% of the problems that you're going to face as a physics or an AP Physics C mechanics student. I will say when you get to this stage right here, when you're talking about the moment of inertia, you may need to do some calculus. If you have an irregular shape, like right in here, you might have to do some calculus here. And I can put a link up in the upper right right about now for some help with that in determining the moment of inertia for an irregular shape or a complex shape that's made up of multiple simple shapes put together, for instance. In any case, this was rather long, but hopefully it's still helpful. And if you have any questions or comments down below, please let me know. And I hope you all have a great day. Take care.